So this program was developed actually at His Holiness the Dalai Lama's request after a meeting he had with a group at Stanford. I think it was 2007 he had this meeting with this researcher called Jim Doty, who is a neuroscientist and was interested in compassion and some of these practices. And after that meeting, the Dalai Lama said, oh, it would be so great if there was a training taking the kind of the contemplative practices, but presenting them in a non-religious way. Because he said, we all need compassion. We all need to develop our compassion. And if it's restricted to just the people interested in Buddhism, what a shame, right? Like we need more people, you know, interested and involved in compassion. So that was the origin. So what today is, is a little bit of a taster, a little bit of an introduction to that eight week training with some of the pieces in it. Some of you, I know Marcella and Jorge have both done the eight week training. So they're back for a refresher and to keep me company today, which is lovely. And some of the rest of you may have actually done the eight-week training too. So this is sort of a a synopsis or a compressed version of that that eight-week training. And so the training includes lots of interactive exercises. We're going to have a couple of times that we're going to be in pairs or triads to discuss things. I'll guide you through meditation practices, more of the contemplative style of meditation practice. We'll also have, I've, we've got paper and pens over there and some of you brought journals. We'll have some written reflections throughout the day. Lots of time for discussion and questions. So it's not just me going blah, blah, blah all day, nor is it just you sitting in silent meditation all day. It's going to be kind of a mixture of a a lot of different modalities for our time. And so for the people joining on Zoom, we'll also have an opportunity to do breakout rooms in the Zoom when you all are doing breakout rooms here in the physical room. So that's kind of the way it's going going to work. And we're going to have a chance for introduction to just a minute, since we're going to be doing some of this interactive stuff. I want to, you know, kind of hear from everybody in the room, first of all, and just get to know each other a little bit to increase the comfort level when we get to the part of the the interactive piece. And so just a little more background before we look at the structure of the day, the you know, this, these practices and these teachings in Buddhism are based on this idea of mental cultivation through contemplation. So this is a really key concept in Buddhism. Sometimes it's not really pointed out explicitly. And I think it's really important to highlight this idea of mental cultivation through contemplation, that we can actually transform our minds through these contemplative practices, right? There are philosophical schools, even psychological schools of thought that say, we're just born with certain characteristics and that's it. You're either blessed to be a nice person, you know, you're either a Mother Teresa or sorry, you know, too bad, right? And Buddhist practice is all based really on this idea that we can actually transform and cultivate our minds, really transform ourselves through contemplative practice, right? So it's important to actually kind of really think about that. And it gives us faith actually in our Buddhist practices. When I started kind of thinking about my practices in that way, it really helped me have more energy for my practice. And this is also a an idea that has been Uh, kind of elevated a little bit in Western psychology recently, too. In fact, there's a researcher at Stanford called Carol Dweck, and she talks about people that have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And the fixed mindset is this idea that you're, you're just you. Maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room. Not so much. You know, you just kind of have the characteristics you have, and then that's sort of it. Versus this idea of a growth mindset, which is just this idea of, yes, we can really grow and transform with these qualities. So that's kind of the basis just conceptually of what we're doing with these practices. And then in terms of the the contemplative practices in Buddhism, 
we have kind of two main streams of meditative practice. One is what we call sometimes focused or single pointed concentration practices. And that's to develop our sense of focus and concentration. So we'll focus on one object might be the sensations of the breath and the body, right? That's found in all Buddhist schools of meditation, or it could be another object. It could be a conceptual object in Tibetan Buddhism, which is my root tradition. A lot of times we'll use a visual image, like a mental image as the, as the focal point of concentration. And then the point there is to bring the mind back over and over and over when it wanders off that object as a way of training our concentration, training our ability to focus. Right. And then the end point of that isn't just to be able to focus well. It's the more we train our focus, then the more we're able to engage in the contemplative practices that develop specific qualities without distraction. Right. If you're meditating on compassion, oh, may I have compassion for all beings? Oh, did I leave the stove on? And God, I got those work emails. Or, oh, right. Compassion. I need to, you know. There's no way without that focused mind that we're going to be able to develop any qualities or get any insights, which is the point of meditation. So the other stream of meditation is more conceptual or analytical or insight based practices. And then that can be divided further into a stream of getting insight into the nature of reality through different practices, because <clears throat> the Buddha said you know, the reason that we suffer is we don't really understand how reality works. For example, getting an insight into the reality of impermanence or the fact that things are changing moment by moment by moment, right? And not understanding that at this deep level, not having a deep realization of that causes so much suffering. I actually, one of my best friends lost her husband just Sunday, last Sunday, very suddenly collapsed on the bathroom floor first thing in the morning, you know, and I've been talking to her a lot this week and she's like been a Buddhist student for 30 years. And she goes like, I shouldn't be shocked that my husband just killed it. You're like, I shouldn't. And I am. And that means I don't have that deep realization. Like, of course we, you know, it's hard to have that. And she goes, I know nothing last forever. Why should I even be shocked and surprised, you know, at this? And I've been looking at that myself too, because this is somebody I've also known for 20 years since they've been married. And it's been like, oh my God, David's not, you know, he's well, yeah, because that happens. So that that is one style of practice, just getting insight into the nature of reality. And then another stream of those conceptual practices is things like developing qualities like compassion, loving kindness, some of these virtuous qualities that we're trying to. And I love the word cultivation because it's not like we're transplanting something that's not already there. Like when you cultivate, you're, you know, putting some fertilizer and compost and weeding and just providing the right conditions for that, which is already growing to like grow better, right? It's already there. So I love this word cultivation because it's not like we don't have the seed of compassion and I'm going to in, you know, by 430 transplant it into your mind magically. That's not the way it works. We have it, but how do we grow it? How do we grow that seed? And Buddhism is full of all kinds of like agricultural metaphors, right? Because the Buddha lived in an agrarian, you know, society. And so there are all of these metaphors and we talk about karmic seeds and we talk about cultivation. And it's interesting because cultivation is actually a direct translation really of the word for meditation, bhavana, that's found in the Buddhist scriptures. And in Tibetan, there's a word for meditation that comes from a root gom, which means habituation or familiarization. So both of these ideas is what we're doing in those contemplative practice. We're cultivating. And in fact, the Buddha would call the monastic community a word that one of my friends who's a translator of Buddhist scriptures translates as cultivators. So the Buddha would say, oh, cultivators, 
meditate well today. Oh, cultivators, you know, listen to what I'm telling you about compassion. So the monastic community was actually known as the cultivators as if they were like, you know, farmers or something like that, but they were like the farmers cultivating the mind, right? So cultivators of the mind. So that's kind of the basis conceptually and sort of philosophically of these practices that we're going to be doing today. And I want to just give you an outline. I'm going to share my screen, which I know is a little tricky because it's behind a lot of you, but I'm just going to share. I just, I'm not going to give you best by PowerPoint at all. There's just going to be a couple. So we're going to go around in just a minute and do introductions of everybody in the room and then talk about our communication agreements for the day. Since we are going to have so many kind of interactive pieces, we are going to have some communication agreements. We're going to explore the meaning of compassion and how it's cultivated. We're going to do start with loving kindness for a loved one and then self-kindness and self-compassion. This is super important, cannot be skipped over. And we'll talk about that. We're going to be spending some time on those practices and then extending compassion to others. And so when we think about this, we think about it in terms of sort of concentric circles. We start with the easy objects of compassion. And then as we're cultivating, we kind of go out in little concentric circles. So we'll be just getting a taste of that throughout the day and then ending the day with how do we extend compassion to others? Even sometimes the difficult people, but we don't start with the most difficult. And that's a mistake we often make. We're like, oh, I want to be compassionate. Okay, Vladimir Putin. And then it's like, uh, maybe we've raised the bar a little high. Maybe just think of the slightly irritating person, but start with the loved one. As then we get that felt sense of what that compassion actually feels like. There's almost a somatic experience of that in the body, sometimes warmth and kind of the ideas that go along with that. So we'll talk about how we're going to cultivate in that way. And then what I'd love to do now before we go into even the communication agreements is do a go round and just hear from everyone really briefly your name. I know where you all are located, but for the people on Zoom, where they're located and what inspires you about compassion, right? What about compassion inspired you to come today to this training? So, you know, so many of us are feeling, I think, this push-pull kind of thing of like the habit of isolation, still wanting to be safe not wanting to be in big, big groups and really craving connections. So it's this really interesting kind of dichotomy. You know, I'm seeing some nods that were like feeling like, wow. I mean, the, I, the first time I was in a big crowded room, I was like, whoa, that's scary. I, I was so overwhelmed, like sensory bombardment, which is sort of my thing anyway, but it was like, wow, loud and so many people and all the things. And like, this is so exciting to be with humans again, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that it is sort of an interesting point for us in our inner relational life right now. Like probably, I mean, you know, this is a conversation I have with some of my other friends that teach things like compassion, this unique kind of, um, what is it, fulcrum or something that we're at just sort of socially and culturally and needing to re-engage and kind of recommit to relational practices, which is, I've been committed to those kind of relational practices when I teach, which a lot of you who know me know. And I think especially now, like people just crave that connection with like-minded people to talk about, you know, the meaningful things. And, and so it's a, it's a perfect time. And then you know, a couple of you mentioned just the benefits of compassion too, which we haven't even really talked about yet. You know, obviously be just being able to meet the world without a sense of threat, with a sense of just openness to at least the possibility of connection, right? I mean, it's not that we're stupid. If there's real threats, we need to respond. 
but there's a, a teacher, a compassion educator and psychotherapist called Paul Gilbert. He's based in the UK. And he talks about these three, uh, three kind of domains of emotional regulation and one or emotional systems. And one is drive, one is threat, and one is like soothe and connect, you know? And it's so easy to stay in drive mode, like always, you know, especially I think our culture really encourages us to be driven, to keep, keep succeeding, keep getting promotions, work hard, answer the emails within five seconds of receiving it, or your boss is going to find, you know, all of that drive kind of emotional system or threat, which was what we felt a lot in COVID. I mean, I found myself just in this fight or flight and there's nothing to run from. It's a virus. Like there's, it's not a grizzly bear. Like seriously, there's nowhere to go. But my whole system was just like, run away, flee. It's scary. And it's like, then you just stuck with all of those emotions in your body. I mean, I remember that one day I talk about this all the time. Some of you are not in the Bay Area. For those of us that were here, it's like there was COVID and then George Floyd's brutal murder and then wildfires throughout the entire state. And there was that one day, August 16th, that's etched in my mind when the sky was just red all day. I had to teach two classes that day and my whole body was telling me to flee. And I'm like checking Cal Fire Twitter account every five nanoseconds to see if I need to evacuate because where I was living, there were evacuations all around. It was the mountains of Santa Cruz, the Redwood Forest. This Buddhist center that was nearby had evacuated to the Buddhist center. So evacuation was very much a possibility. And I'm trying to settle myself and go teach the class, get your prefrontal cortex back online. You don't have to have this fight or flight. But it was fully happening. Oh, and the presidential election, let me not forget. We were in the middle of that whole, I won't say a bad word, but that thing. So it's like... That's kind of what we're coming out of that a lot of you, you know, I think we share this kind of collective experience. So activating the soothing of compassion and connection is good for us too. You know, it's not just about, oh, this is something, I'll be a nice person for all those other people. And we'll talk more about the overwhelm that can be a danger if we get our compassion practice wrong. Because I've had many people say, I don't want to do compassion training. I'm just going to be burned out like all the time. There are going to be so many people coming at me for compassion, like, nope, not doing that. Right. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how that's not actually even a possibility with true compassion. Right. It's getting it kind of off base. But, you know, that so it it actually helps us. And obviously, the more compassionate we are. I mean, how do we choose our friends? How do we choose our social networks? Do you choose to hang out with people who are completely self-absorbed and just like self-focused? Probably not, you know, unless you have to, unless you're related to them and you have to at Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. But otherwise you're like, that's over. <laughs> We're going home now, right? So it's like connecting and it's resourcing. It's deeply resourcing for us emotionally and it really helps build resilience having that sense of connection and compassion and sometimes we overlook also the benefit for us there's more and more research and more and more studies done on the benefits of compassion both for us and for social groups so we'll we'll get into that we'll talk about that so the first thing we're going to do is a little exploration about what is compassion i've been using the word a lot already but we're going to look at a definition, but first I want you all to do a little exploration I'm going to guide you through. But first I want to just look at the communication guidelines really quickly before we do some of our group work. And some of you have worked with me before, familiar with these, just some guidelines for our time together. Oops, that's not it. That's the 
So guidelines for our communication, and this is because we are going to be spending some time in small groups and sharing and discussion and dialogue. So keeping conversations confidential in both big and small groups. And what I mean by that is both for the big room and when you're working in pairs or small groups, not to say what one of your partners said in any way that would identify them outside of the context. So outside of this room at the end of the day, not sharing what someone said in a way that would identify them. And what we might do, I, I think we're, we're recording. We might pause when we get to some of the sharing back just so that that won't necessarily be recorded to keep the confidentiality. And then when you're in a small group, also not coming back and saying, oh, Karen said that well, she was really struggling with compassion with so-and-so. Right, that kind of thing. So pretty clear. Asking permission for follow-up conversations. And what I mean by this is sometimes someone will share something kind of vulnerable, right? That's kind of transparent and vulnerable. Sometimes what happens after that is someone will rush up to them during the break and go, oh, that same thing happened to me. And this is what you should do about it. They may be done, right? Like that may be the emotional burden that they might need to kind of take a break. And so, you know, just be really conscious and also of fixing it. If somebody shares something and seems emotionally activated, sometimes everybody wants to rush up and hug them during the break and that might feel really exposed to. So just being aware of that kind of thing. You guys in Zoom can't hug each other. So for you, you don't have to worry so much about this one. Sharing your story and not offering advice and problem solving, which we also can tend to do just out of our care for others. You have a right to pass if I call on you or if we're sharing like in a group, you do have a right to pass if you just feel like there's something kind of tender coming up or you just don't want to share. And then conscious participation. And by this, what I mean is love it when people are engaged and have a lot to say, but if you notice that you're always the first one with your hand up, always have a lot of questions, just be aware of the collective space and how much space you're taking up. And then also, if you tend to be one of the quieter voices, I'd love to encourage you to maybe share a little bit more into the group. So just sort of titrating a little bit your own participation. So any questions about those agreements or anything that anybody would like to add before we take the slide down, anything that would make you feel more comfortable in the space that's not on here. And the Zoom, Zoomiverse people. Okay. Yes. I wanted to say I really appreciate the share your story with Joe Crawford, but it's been so lovely to just ask themselves. Yeah. It's such a yeah. Yeah. For someone, and that alone is so touching. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's that's such an important one because again, through our care, we want to help. Always, we want to fix things, but sometimes it can feel that just being there and hearing the story is huge, right? And just offering, we're going to talk a little bit more about empathy and the quality of empathy and just empathic listening to someone's experience is huge. We don't have, you know, and sometimes our own discomfort, I think prompts us to problem solve and just sitting with that and just going, wow, okay, maybe it's not, or it's not up to me. And I could just, yeah, like you said, hold the space for this person's experience. That can be really powerful. We're going to actually practice that really explicitly in an exercise that we do a little bit later on. By the way, speaking of, I think I said something about breaks. I'm going to stop sharing this right now. Just to give you an idea of the day, we will have a break. We'll have a mid-morning break in maybe half an hour-ish or so. And then we'll have a lunch break for a, at least an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. At some point, probably 1230-ish, something like that. We'll just kind of look for a good stopping point and then a break in the afternoon also. But if any point you need a break, 
don't, you know, if you need to go to the restroom or you just need to stand up or you need a breath of fresh air, you know, sometimes a lot of vulnerability can come up. And if you need to move, if you need to stand, if you just need to take a break, please take care of yourselves. Don't feel like you're, you know, walk into your chair until I ring the bell and give you a break. So, yeah, yeah. Any questions before we go into the contemplation? Any questions, too, about any of what I've said so far about contemplative practice or this idea of cultivation through contemplative practice or anything that I've said up until now? Okay. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, we're going to look at what compassion is and what it isn't. But first, what we're going to do is what my friend Eve Ekman, who's one of the main teachers here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, she says, there's research and then there's me search, right? So we look inside of our own experience. And so I'm going to lead you through a contemplation that we're going to draw from memory of an experience of compassion then try to kind of figure out what is compassion? Why did I think of that? And then we'll have a chance to share in small groups and then come back and kind of build a definition of compassion from your own experience. So I'm going to guide you through just a brief 10 minute or so contemplation. So just get in a comfortable posture with your back straight as comfortable wherever you are. For the people at home, you might be sitting on a cushion or cross-legged or a sofa or a chair. Your shoulders even. And so when we do these contemplations, we like to conjoin the qualities of relaxation and alertness. And the way we do that mostly is through our posture. So you're getting that nice upright spine. Your body relaxed around that. And your eyes can either be closed or slightly open. If you want a little, little bit of light in, that keeps you from getting sleepy. And then just settling with the breath for a few moments, just focusing on the sensations of the breath in the body. And now we're going to draw from memory. And so I'll invite you to bring to mind a time when you recognized an experience of compassion. And so it could have been either that you felt compassion yourself towards someone else. So either you offered compassion or felt compassion towards someone else. Or maybe someone was compassionate to you. You received compassion from someone else. Or it could even be that you witnessed an act of compassion. So maybe you were neither the giver nor the receiver of compassion, but you actually just were a witness to some compassionate act. And so just take a moment, if there are several examples that you've experienced, that's wonderful, but just pick one for the purpose of this exercise. And it might be something that's happened recently or something that really made a strong impression. And then let the details come to mind. Who was there? What happened? Was it an action or words involved or just a feeling that either you experienced 
towards someone or that you received from someone? What were some of the components of that experience? What happened? And how did it feel for you and the other people involved? And then did it lead to anything? Did something else happen? So let all the details really come to mind as clearly as possible as you're remembering that episode. And then how did you recognize that experience as an example of compassion? So what was it about that episode that you remembered that made you choose that? When I asked you to think of an example of compassion, what was it about that that made you choose that episode or that experience? What are some of the characteristics of compassion that you can identify from that experience? So we're going to go into small groups in just a minute, but I'll invite you first to just write down what came up for you, especially in terms of what are some of the characteristics of compassion that you identified from that experience? What are some of the ways that you identify that as compassion? And there's paper, there's pads up at the front desk if you want to grab them. So just a couple of minutes of just noting down, what was it about that that made you identify that as compassion? So especially like write down anything that came up during that contemplation, but especially what we're going to share is what are the characteristics of compassion? Like how did you identify what happened there as compassion. We'll unpack a little bit. So unpacking compassion. So this is, you know, and so many of you have have named qualities of this definition. This is a four-part definition from the Stanford group that came up with the compassion cultivation training course. And it's four parts that are kind of progressive. And the first two parts could strictly speaking be called empathy. And then empathy actually leads to compassion or can lead to compassion. We'll talk about another pathway of where empathy can lead when it doesn't lead to compassion. But many of you have talked about this. So there's a piece that we call cognitive. Sometimes we call this cognitive empathy a cognitive awareness of the suffering or stress, either in oneself or another. And that's that perspective taking piece. And Anissa, Anissa talked about that with like putting herself in the shoes of this mother who'd lost the child. Like cognitively, we have an understanding. We have that perspective taking. We're kind of taking 
the stance almost of that other person imagining what it would be like to be having their experience. And then there's an affective piece, an emotional response being moved by the suffering. And again, compassion by definition, we're talking about suffering. We're talking about meeting suffering. So in here, we're having that emotional resonance, that emotional response of care and concern, which as human beings, we are, we've got that on lock. Like a, there are other species that have empathy. In fact, a lot of research done on our primate cousins, especially, right? Who have also all the, all the facial expressions of, of emotion. You know, that the people that have taken the cultivating emotional balance, which Eve teaches, like all the facial expressions are the same. For many of the major emotions, also empathy. Other species too, there are even studies now done on fish, which we kind of don't think really have an emotional life. <laughs> on is like, oh God, fish, right? But as humans, you know, apparently we have this capacity to resonate with the emotional experience of another, even if we don't know what's going on. Mostly through the facial expressions, we get sent body language and all these cues, vocal tones. You don't have to know the story. You walk into a cafe and someone's sitting there with a bouquet of flowers, like the beautiful one that Anna brought, and they're crying. And then there's another dirty coffee cup right across from them. And you're like, somebody just broke up. You know, because <laughs> you know, there she is. And she's like trying to kind of pull it together. And you, you know, your heart, like we have this expression in English, like your heart goes out. You just resonate. I mean, that's that that resonance and that connection with the emotional experience of another. And to get to Tom's question, which is why I said perfect timing, it's said that with the people that we know and love and are connected to, we have more of the affective and we have more of the cognitive empathy with strangers. So we have more of the emotional connection with the loved one, like people that we know and they're close to us, which can lead to the overwhelm. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. And it's, but it's, we have more of that cognitive perspective taking with strangers. So that's the proportions. And sometimes we talk about having balanced empathy helps us stay present in the face of suffering because affective, we can be flooded and actually merge with the experience of another. And it's not really helpful and it's not, doesn't lead to compassion because we're just overwhelmed and we're like, I can't even, I'm out of here, right? When we're too merged and too much perspective taking or understanding without the warmth is just kind of cold, right? So we want to have both of these two, you know, and balance those. And then on the basis of that, and this is where we get into the realm of what we would call compassion. And in fact, this is the Buddhist definition, intentional, the wish to alleviate the suffering in some way. So we're resonating with the suffering, we're understanding the suffering, we're feeling care and concern, and then we have that wish to relieve it in some way. And then the motivational, the last piece, the motivation to act on the wish, we haven't done anything yet at all. We can have fully fledged, 100% qualified, tick all four boxes, compassion, without doing anything. And then that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother workshop. Is there anything we can do? Are we qualified to do? Would it be interfering if we did the thing? All the things about compassionate action and altruistic action, that's another whole long story. And in Buddhist practice, we say, you know, often there's this uh, metaphor of the, the bird that has the two wings of compassion and wisdom, right? And the bird needs both wings to fly. We need the compassion, but we need the wisdom piece too. And sometimes, you know, some of the two Tibetan Buddhist lamas, they'll use this phrase, idiot compassion, which is just like bumbling in. I'm going to, da, 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 da. I'm going to save the day and you just make it worse. Anybody a survivor of idiot compassion? I don't know. Show of hands. <laughs> or he's like, yeah, for sure. Right. So. 
did the doing piece is a whole nother piece, but like we, we are engaged, we wish to alleviate, we motivate on that. We're going to take a break now, but after we come back from the break, we'll look at how then that protects us from the overwhelm. Because when we're wishing and when we're motivating to act, it actually brings other parts of the brain online that protect us from that fight or flight overwhelm emotional response. So we say that compassion actually protects us. And just a spoiler alert, so you come back after the break, you know, some there's a word that's used a lot these days, compassion burnout or compassion fatigue, a lot of the emotions researchers and the compassion researchers says there's actually no such thing. It's impossible to have that. What we're, what we're experiencing, the thing they call compassion fatigue is actually empathic distress, which is a thing, but compassion fatigue isn't because if we're really going to compassion, it's debatable. There's different views about that, but that's sort of the school of thought that I've been trained is that's a different thing, that empathic distress. So with that, I will give you a well-deserved, how about eight minutes? And then we can come back in California. That would make it 1135. And your other time zones, add or subtract. And we'll see you in about eight minutes. So the first one is about getting, you know, kind of receiving spontaneous kindness from strangers. So we differentiate, and in Buddhism, we differentiate between loving kindness and compassion. So we say they're two different things. They show up in the Tibetan tradition in what we call the four immeasurables. In the Pali tradition, the four Brahma Viharas. So loving kindness, which is a trans translation of Maitri or Metta. And then compassion is known as karuna. So we say that the compassion is in the, in the response to suffering with the wish to relieve the suffering. But loving kindness is just the wish for others to have happiness, right? And so I think those momentary moments of connection, unless you've tripped and fallen and somebody comes up and says, oh, and tries to get you up and help you, but just those moments of someone smiles, someone jokes, that's just the kind of kindness that we can just show each other. It's like in that moment, you're just connecting. I mean, I have this thing that some of you have heard me say, I was trying to use the name on somebody's name tag in a store because it makes them so happy. Like they're standing there for their eight hour shift in the grocery store and nobody once has even treated them like a human and you're like hey Susie how it's how's it going they always just light up it's so easy it's one sentence right so that kind of thing that it's it's so easy to just give kindness and spread that around but I would call that kindness instead of compassion unless there is a suffering that's being met you know, the, and, and their kid can be that was a total stranger too. Like you see that somebody has just got that face and they're having a bad day. And then you're trying to lighten their day with, you know, a moment, right? But sometimes it's just the way that we're all just like, I heard, I heard actually that I was reading a book set in Botswana and they said there's a very traditional African saying when you're with someone who's going through a hard time and you just say, I see you, you know, I see you. And I've heard people saying that. And I say that too. I just like, I see you, I see you. And it's that way. Jo Joelette, wow. Joelle, Joelle, Joelle was talking before just being with, just being like, I see you, I get you. So that also can be compassion, but the friendliness can also be a form of kindness. So that's one thing. And then in terms of, the animals, and I think especially animals, like they say, we co-evolved, especially with dogs, but also with cats. And so I think there could be a lot of empathy and emotional connection. I housed it for these three little dogs. They're Havanese, which are these cute little fluffy things. And their names are Che, Camillo, and Chiquita. And Chiquita, like if you're having a bad day, Chiquita's like <laughs> right there in your face. Like she will just, you know, you can be on the phone, like just having a hard conversation. And she's just like, it, you know, she's like this big and just like a cotton ball with, you know, eyes and ears. 
So I think there can be that attunement for sure, especially with these species that co-evolve with us. And then that might be empathy, like the emotional kind of that affective empathy. And what was the third one? What was the Nature. third point? Nature. So Paul Gilbert, who talks about those three emotional regulation systems, and I think we probably many of us have experienced the soothing quality of being in nature. So that can activate the soothing system in the same way that being around someone who really loves you and cares for you. And then there's some explanations of why that is. It's like, okay, we evolved to be in nature and you know what, what's going on there. But yeah, for sure, when you say being soothed, I mean, a lot of times when I'm upset about something, I'll just go for a walk, you know, in in nature somewhere and just kind of be out there. And I'm not sure the physiology of that, but that definitely seems to be true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It was um, sometimes also that compassion from our um, Dharma teachers, you know, our Kohanas. Yeah. That somehow they should sing soothe this. Yeah, um, yeah. This compassion. And I, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that's one of the things. There's a felt sense to that almost like a baseline state of compassion, like through our training, you know, there's almost this, and we talk about it when we talk about emotions, we say there can be an emotion, there can be a mood, there can be a state, and there can be a trait. And we don't say compassion is an actual emotion. It's more, but it could be at the level of a trait. It can either be like almost a compassionate mood, like we're in a place of compassion, we're feeling a lot of compassion, and then you're off to like, what do I want next? And I'm gonna binge watch the thing I want. You know, the trait level or the state level, but it can almost be, I think, trained. So it's just a trait that's kind of there 24 seven. And I think that's a lot of the promise of these kind of training, like, can we cultivate? And you can feel it. You can feel a compassionate presence, you know, even without words, like there's some vibe there that you can really feel. So I think that is sort of the culmination of the training is that that's just a a trait that we're expressing kind of all the time. Yeah, great, great feedback. Thank you, Anna. Any other questions or clarifications about the definition or anything? Someone was asking for a year camera, which is nine. Oh my gosh. I mean, unless- Yes, no, I just was not, I wasn't feeling shy, I was just clueless. (laughs) (laughs) They sometimes go hand in hand. Yeah, thank you for the request. Anything else about the definition? Well, let's look at another couple of pieces. And this is in terms of the of the training and the cultivation that we've been talking about. And so when we talk about cultivation and the way we're going to be doing it, when we're going to do a meditation before the lunch break, our first, you know, kind of deep cultivation meditation, we start with the comfort zone. It's a safe place to reflect. And this diagram is used in education, but it also can be applied to our contemplative practice and just about everything. I use, I pull out the three circles diagram like all the time. It is just such a great, great uh, kind of paradigm for learning. So our comfort zone. So in terms of compassion, it's our loved ones, right? Like that's, natural that's automatic that we already have remember i said we talk about cultivation because we're not like transplanting something that's not there we're almost all humans there are a couple a very very small percentage and there's even a debate about this of people who might be called like psychopaths and there's actually something going on with the brain chemistry that possibly for people like that Empathy is not possible, so compassion wouldn't be possible. Tiny percentage of the population. So for all practical purposes, we all have a comfort zone of compassion with the loved ones. Compassion towards ourselves may or may not be in the comfort zone. We'll talk about that a lot this afternoon, right? When we talk about self-compassion, whether that's in the comfort zone. And then there's a learning zone. Sometimes this Next one is called a growth zone. So we're challenging ourselves a little bit to get out of the comfort zone. If we stay in the comfort zone, 
we're never going to change. We're going to have compassion for our loved ones, which is awesome, but doesn't make us any different from anyone else. So for compassion cultivators, right, we're trying to stretch and think of the people that may not be in the inner circle. And that might be the people not so close to us. It might be strangers at this point. It might be the self. The self can totally be the growth zone or the learning zone. Like to develop self-compassion may very much be a challenge for a lot of us and is. And we'll look at that a little bit more. So the growth zone, the learning zone, and then the panic zones in some charts, we call it the overwhelm zone. That's we've gone too far. Right. And we're just going to freak out and shut down. So don't even go there. So whether it's Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or Adolf Hitler or whoever, you're the person who broke your heart the most. Don't start there. Don't go there. And these zones are dynamic. You know, with our practice, and I've really noticed this more and more. People are in the comfort zone for me, as, you know, over years and years of practice. But I noticed, oh, wow, check it out. Like my heart can kind of open to people that I know for sure before I started these practices. No way. And then it may be at the point where you have become one of those extraordinary people. The whole everything's blue. All beings are in the comfort zone. I mean, that's the vision. Not to say that you condone harmful behavior, and that's really, really important. So we're separating the person from the behavior. We can have compassion for the person and still do whatever we have to to prevent harm, of course, and not to say, oh, I'm compassionate, so it's okay that you do the things that are harmful. And that's the tricky bit. And for me, that's the edge, is how do I hold my heart open to someone and also even stand up sometimes quite forcefully, which I've done again to stop further harm, but not demonize the person. You know, somebody was talking to me the other day and it was somebody who doesn't come from this training and this paradigm. And they're talking about someone and you hear this and they call them a monster. And I'm like, in my world, there are no monsters. They're just really wounded people who are, you know, what's the thing, hurt people, hurt people. And so even with people who engage in harm, seeing, wow, that wouldn't be happening, you know, unless they had been so wounded in some way. And yes, really important, they not harm. But that's the kind of shift that can happen over time, right, with the practice, but very gradually. And I introduced this because so many people, I think, who are very enthusiastic about compassion practice go straight to the hardest case in their first meditation. And then they're totally overwhelmed and they're like, oh, I can't do this compassion thing. That was just a oh, re triggering of all the trauma, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, no, no, pump the brakes, dial it back. Let's start slow and just go at your own pace, but also not just staying so, so comfortable with it, you know, thinking about, and we'll, we'll look a lot more later this afternoon about how do we do that? How do we extend compassion to people who are not, you know, the close ones? So any questions about that, that graph before we move on. So that's kind of how we do it. Just one little concentric circle at a time, you know, really, really gradually how we expand. All right. And then before we do our meditation, I wanted to share one more. And this is, I, I talked about this before, you know, the difference between why we don't even use the word compassion fatigue or compassion burnout. And this comes from research, especially Tanya Singer, who's a compassion researcher. She's based at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, I think it is in Germany. She does a lot of compassion research. And so this comes from a paper that she co-wrote with some of her colleagues. So empathy, so the upper pathway is the one that we're trying to foster. Compassion, empathic concern, <clears throat> sympathy which is other related, right? So we're focusing on the other. It's a positive feeling. 
It leads to good health and a pro-social motivation, which means it's connecting us to others, right? We're showing up for others motivated to be connecting, right? That's the compassion pathway. And empathy, especially if it's out of balance, that we're not balancing the cognitive piece with the emotional care and concern and the connection can lead to distress, empathic or personal distress and overwhelm, which is self-related. So suddenly it becomes about us, doesn't feel good and causes us to withdraw. And I think we've all felt that at times. It's just too big, or you're trying to connect in a way that's out of balance to the suffering. And I was really moved, Tom, talking about the cat and just what he was feeling with that caring concern sounded very balanced to me because it was a positive feeling. And we talked about that word bittersweet, right? And he was able to stay with that experience, even though it was really hard. So that pro-social motivation to care for the cat to stay with rather than, oh, I can't, you know, I can't be in this situation <clears throat> and I need to withdraw. So thinking about that, is it really compassion fatigue if we feel a fear of developing our compassion because we're afraid we're going to get even more overwhelmed? It's like, oh, I already feel like I'm compassionate. You was talking about in his work situation in the face of suffering a lot. Is it going to make me even just more raw and vulnerable and exposed and overwhelmed? And that's not, and this is a lot of research backed up. I mean, it's what the Buddha said, which is good enough for me. And, you know, there's a lot of like neuroscience and a lot of research also pointing to this, that compassion is resourcing, right? It gives us resilience and it's deeply resourcing if we get the balance right. And if we're not feeling pity and if we're not feeling empathic distress and overwhelm. So any questions about that? Okay, well, let's, I'm gonna stop sharing and let's get into our first practice. And so for our first meditation practice, which is the first step in the eight week course, we meditate on compassion and loving kindness for a loved one. And this is a way that we think of it, I think of it as like the priming step to get a felt sense of what compassion and loving kindness feels like, because we're talking about the comfort zone here. We're starting with the comfort zone to get that felt sense of what we naturally feel, right? In the very traditional Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist um, sequence of developing the meditations, and this is something that Chupin Jimpa, who is His Holiness the Dalai Lama's main English translator, some of you may have seen him translating, and is also a Buddhist scholar in his own right, amazing being. He helped to develop the Stanford Compassion Training, and when he first started developing it, he said, oh, you know, in the traditional Tibetan Buddhist world, we start with the self, because the idea is, oh, well, we have more kindness and compassion for ourselves, like, obviously. And he said, I don't know what's going on with you guys, but that was not like, I mean, we were like, no, it's complicated, right? So he said, you know, I needed to switch the order, even though it wasn't the real traditional order and start with a loved one, because that was more easy for people in the modern world, apparently. And it differs, it might differ. We may have done a lot of work, you know, on self-compassion that may be very accessible, but for most of us, and it's important to pick what we call the appropriate loved one. And what I mean by this is people with whom we share, I mean, all human relationships are complicated, but as uncomplicated as possible, which might mean the person you don't negotiate household chores, because in addition to your love and compassion, you might also start to trigger some frustration, especially if they didn't do the dishes last night and they're still in the sink and you like already expecting getting home at 430 and the dishes will still be in the sink. That kind of thing. Teenage children, Marcella, also <laughs> sometimes not. Of course, there's love and care there. And sometimes, you know frustration and so forth. 
So sometimes the person to pick for this kind of meditation could maybe be like the best friend, right? Or someone maybe not personally related or that you share like a daily connection with, but you know, your closest friend who's got your back. I mean, that happened, like I mentioned this week with my friend's partner dying and, you know, I, she lives too far away for me to show up. And yesterday on the phone, she was just like, I can't tell you how much it means that you, I know you've got my back. You've been having my back for 30 years. You'll always have it. I feel such like the stability of that. So that kind of relationship, you know, where we can feel, and it can't be a pet too. The loved one can be a pet because sometimes that's dogs. It's so unconditional. You've been gone five minutes and you come home and you're like, oh my God, I thought you'd never come back. I love you more than anything in the world. You're like that kind of feeling. You know, might be what gives us that priming feeling. And then on the basis of that, and then that's what we'll explore more this afternoon. Can we take that natural feeling that we have and expand it out to, you know, more of the concentric circles? Now, I don't at all expect that by 4.30 this afternoon, your growth zone will have, or your comfort zone will have expanded <laughs> tremendously. And hopefully you'll have some tools if you want to continue the exploration of that. But yeah, don't feel like, oh, I'm not able to walk out on 40, the 24th Street with my heart open to all these. You know? Okay, slowly, slowly, okay. All right, so we're gonna practice. So I will guide you through, and, and I think a lot of people in this room might be familiar with this kind of contemplative practice, or sometimes we call it analytical meditation, where I'll guide you through some prompts and then pause and just kind of think about the prompts. I'll also invite you to repeat some phrases. Then some, for some people, the phrases really works, and this involves the visualization. So just follow my prompts and I'll pause and guide yourself through when I've paused. So First of all, just getting in our meditation posture with our back straight, shoulders even. Your hands can either be resting in your lap or resting on your knees and your eyes either closed or slightly open. And settling into your body. So we've been sitting for a while. Just noticing if there's anywhere in your body that needs a little bit of attention, a little bit of relaxation. And I'll invite you to just relax deeply with the exhale. And now with this relaxed but focused mind, picture someone for whom you feel a great amount of love and affection. It could be your child, maybe a grandparent or a close friend. Maybe even a mentor, someone who's been really important in your life as a guide. Or this object of your deep compassion and loving kindness could be a pet. So taking a moment to choose someone. And again, choosing someone that the relationship is not as complicated, that it's going to bring up a lot of myth feelings, but as much as possible, someone you Imagine that thinking of them is going to bring feelings of compassion and loving kindness. Yeah. 
And then try to picture this person as vividly as possible. If you can get a mental image, an image in your mind's eye, or just a felt sense of their presence. And if, if it's helpful, you can imagine them just seated in front of you. And again, just getting a mental image of this person or just a felt sense. And as this person's presence, as their image becomes clear, it's really noticing what you're feeling, noticing what the feeling of love and connection that you have towards this person makes you feel. You might even feel physical sensation of warmth in your body, in your heart, for example. Just take a few moments to really feel into what that sense of love and care and connection feels like. And then I invite you to also recite the following phrases silently in your mind, because this helps to deepen that feeling of care and connection. So with these sentiments of love, silently reciting the following phrases, may you be happy, May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. So continue with these phrases silently when you need to, just mentally refreshing that picture of your loved one or that felt sense of their presence as you recite the phrases. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. And now as you breathe out, imagine that you extend a warm golden light from your heart that carries all your feelings of love and connection. So just from the center of your chest, from your heart, this warm golden light goes out, touches your loved one, bringing them peace and happiness. So couple this visualization along with the phrases, <clears throat> may you be happy, may you be free from suffering, may you find peace and joy, and really feeling with all your heart the wish that your loved one achieves happiness.
And now think of a time when the same person was going through a really difficult experience. Maybe they were ill or going through some disappointment, maybe at work or in their personal life, or maybe a relationship difficulty, or maybe it lost their job, just some challenge. If it's anyone that we've been close to for any period of time, of course, we all go through difficulties and hardships. Maybe it's someone who really struggled with the isolation of the COVID lockdown, emotionally, anything at all, but imagining whatever they might have gone through that you're aware of and really noticing how it feels when you bring your loved one's suffering to mind. Do you feel a connection to their experience, even to their pain? Do you feel a wish to reach out and help to do whatever you can to ease the suffering? Just notice what comes up for you when you think of your loved one going through that difficulty. And then while continuing to focus on your breathing, focusing on these feelings of tenderness, concern, the urge to do something that might arise in you when you imagine your friend suffering. And I'll invite you to couple those feelings with the following phrases. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. And then really noticing the sensations that you experience as you imagined your loved one. And as you send those feelings of tenderness and concern and care. And then again, imagining as you breathe out, extending that warm golden light from the center of your heart that touches your loved one. And imagine when they're touched with that light, it actually eases their suffering, bringing peace and ease. And so with each out-breath, imagine sending out that golden light from your heart that actually relieves the suffering of your loved one. And you can continue with the phrases, as you couple it with that visualization of the golden light, may you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace.
May you be free from suffering. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. Continue to send that warm light. Imagine it relieving their suffering. I'm feeling with all of your heart the wish that your loved one be free from suffering, from fear, from anxiety, and feeling that you're actually able to relieve them. And now for the final few moments of the meditation, really refreshing your feelings of warmth and tenderness and affection for your loved one. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. We're sending those thoughts of loving kindness, wishing them happiness, and the thoughts of compassion, wishing them freedom from suffering and holding that loved one in your mind's eye. May you be happy. May you be free from suffering. May you find peace and joy. May you be free from fear and anxiety. May you find safety and peace. And then releasing the visualization, releasing the phrases, and just returning for a moment to the sensations in your body, just feeling what's alive in your body, whatever thoughts there are in your mind. Just take a few moments to relax your posture and gently come out of meditation. I'd love to invite if there are any comments or questions or experiences that you had with that meditation, epiphany, difficulty, anything in between, anything to clarify or share about that experience. And again, we didn't start with the self because that may, for a lot of people, you know, is not the most comfortable peace and sometimes can be quite challenging and 
super important not to skip over and go, no, no, no. You know, and those of us in the Buddhist world, I mean, I see this thing I'm, that I'm personally also a survivor of, which John Wellwood, Eve's teacher's late husband calls spiritual bypassing of like, oh no, I'll jump over all my own personal messy BS to, sorry, did I say that? That was bad. And if the recording's on to, you know, <laughs> other sentient beings, it's like, I'm a Buddhist. So I'll focus on others. That's easier. I'm a mess. But if I'm a Buddhist, but that's not it either. That's not it either. We say in the Tibetan tradition, we're always talking about equalizing self and others, right? So it means we're neither raised up in this arrogant, self-absorbed way. It's not out of balance in this way. But I find many people drawn to spiritual practice have the other fault of like, oh, no, I'll be fine. I'll just sit in the dark alone, eating the bird crests of bread. And it's like, dude, that's not what the Buddha said. Like, please, right? So we can get so far in that direction, which is also not balanced, you know? And over and over again, when I talk about empathy, I talk about balance. When I talk about these practices, you know, we're so terrified of not being humble or something, or we're so, so yeah, anyway, that's a whole nother thing, but we will get to that after lunch. I'll go on off on a rant right now, but we'll, we'll look at when we come back, We'll look at self-kindness and self-compassion because out of the eight-week Stanford training, we spent two whole weeks on the self because it wasn't enough to just have one week out of eight on us. We're so complicated, we require two weeks. So we'll, talk, we'll look at that first and then we'll go on to ex how do we extend to others that aren't right in that comfort zone. And we spent a lot of time right this morning, just looking at the nuances of compassion, because I think it's so important to get what it really is. It's not pity. It's not self-effacement. It's not being a doormat, like all the things we might think compassion are. It's not any of those things. It's just meeting others with that care and concern and wish for them to be alleviated from suffering. And we need to also be clear about the boundary for it to be sustainable. So we'll talk more about that this afternoon as we get into how do we extend sustainably, because that's, that's the whole point, right? So let's just begin by settling for just a minute, just getting into a comfortable posture and bring our attention first to our body and just relaxing if we feel any tightness or tension. And just taking a few moments to use the breath to just arrive back into the space, into our bodies, into the present moment. I was excited by all the bakeries and papayas out on the street, so I need to bring myself back to <laughs> compassion space. <laughs> Used to using the breath as an anchor wherever the sensations are apparent in the body, maybe in the diaphragm, maybe the chest rising and falling, maybe the sensations at the nostrils. And then for those of you that were here this morning, we spent some time just looking at and talking about our intention and our motivation for being here for this workshop today. So just taking a moment to just refresh or renew your intention. And it might be that something has changed, something about what you've heard has shifted something for you, perhaps. We're just taking a moment to renew our motivation. We say in Buddhist practice that we get more out of any kind of teaching or meditation or even a study session if we're really clear going in and really set a strong intention. So just taking a moment.
then just relaxing and coming back to the space. Okay, so just to review a little bit what we've been talking about so far. So we started out this morning first, just talking about the idea of mental cultivation through contemplation, that we actually think about what Carol Dweck from Stanford calls having a growth mindset, which means that we can actually transform and change. And that's sort of the philosophy behind Buddhist contemplative practice, any, any kind of Buddhist practice, actually, instead of having a fixed mindset saying, we just are the way we are, you know, we can't change so much, maybe we can be a little tiny bit nicer if we really try hard. But this idea of just really engaging in transformative contemplative practice is really what all the practices that we're doing today are based on that philosophy. And then I invited you to think of a experience of compassion that you'd have. And then we heard about what the qualities of compassion are. And then looking at that definition that comes from the Stanford Compassion Cultivation Training that has two aspects that are actually empathy leading to compassion. So it's that kind of four part, which is more of a sequence. It's not really kind of four separate things, but it's sort of sequential a little bit. So we have the, you know, the cognitive empathy, the perspective taking, and then that emotional resonance, that affective empathy. And then we have the actual wish for the suffering to be relieved. And then the motivation is the fourth part, the motivation to engage in an action to relieve the suffering. And then, as I said, the action part, that's complicated. Can we, you know, do we have the ability? Is it going to be really beneficial and helpful? You know, we have a we have an idea in Buddhism that we call skillful means. And I had a student, I was living in New Zealand for a number of years teaching and a student pretty much every weekend retreat I would lead. He would be like, could you lead a retreat in skillful means? <laughs> I go, well, it, you just develop with wisdom over your life and mostly trying and failing, right? And how many of us have tried to help people? There's so many people I've tried to help that I've made it all worse or not been helpful or they're not speaking to me anymore or any number of things, right? So there's that piece of like, we could totally wish to help, you know, be so motivated to do anything. And either there's nothing you know, that we can do that's really helpful or we just don't know enough or we don't know. And I think, you know, I was talking to a friend this week and a friend who was wanting to take in a young woman who is in the foster system and, you know, the family that was taking care of her, didn't want to take care of her anymore through this whole complicated thing. And he was like, me and my family have a spare room. And he was all in, but it had to be also his family and his wife and his two teenage sons. And the oldest son is like graduating from high school and has so much going on that they were just like, wow, I don't think we've really got the bandwidth, you know, to take in this person. And then he ended up finding another home, but he was caught in that thing of like, how do you help everyone in the situation? There's a yes maybe from your side to help someone, but then it compromises the welfare of other people that you care about in your lives. Like, unfortunately, we just can't take in every unhoused person that we walk past on the street. You know, all the things of how complicated that is. But to go back to the definition of compassion, we have fully qualified compassion, you know, with that wish and that motivation, even if there's nothing we can do. And that's protective. And we looked at that chart of empathy, which can lead to compassion and can also lead to empathic distress. So with compassion, there's parts of the brain that are activated that actually protect us from that overwhelm and that burnout and getting just flooded and overwhelmed. You know, in the brain, there's a whole system called the limbic system, this emotional system, you know, sometimes associated with fight or flight. So when we're flooded with emotion, often that's the system that comes online and we're, you know, we get into this fight, flight, freeze. But with compassion, we're thinking, you know, with the frontal cortex, we're thinking, what can I do? Could I do something? And it gets us out of that 
overwhelmed feeling. So it actually helps build resilience and it's protective of us. And then the last thing we did before the lunch break is starting, you know, we looked at the kind of concentric circles of the comfort zone, the growth zone, and the overwhelm. And so we started looking at how we begin the practice of cultivating compassion by thinking of the loved one and just getting a felt sense of what does it feel like when I think of this person that I naturally really care for. And then we'll try you know, over the rest of the practices to kind of expand that feeling. So I wanted to pause after that and just see if there's any leftover questions or any questions or clarification or anything you'd like to share. What I want to talk about next, and we'll do a practice, is self-compassion. And again, what it is and what it's not. Because as we talked about this morning in the very traditional Tibetan Buddhist presentation, the idea is, well, duh, of course we start with loving kindness and compassion for ourselves because that's the easiest. Is it easiest for anybody? The easier thing. Yeah, you're a rock. Can you come sit up here and talk about this? It, but you did work. You were saying earlier you did a lot of work on self-compassion yeah. to make it easy. Yeah, because I have it myself. Yeah. So I, my, I, I was a monster. Yeah. So, uh, oh, do you want to grab the mic? Because I think this would be, yeah. Or hey, sure. can you be my my lovely assistant? I can ask you know. <laughs> yeah, I had a breaking point um, in my mid twenties, uh, very uh, activating um, yeah. traumatic experience. And um, I lost all love and compassion for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it also made me realize I didn't have love for myself. I had self-esteem. Yeah, 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 I had things I liked about myself that were material, like, Look at me, I'm creative. Yeah. Look at me, I'm talented. Look at me, even like I'm a good friend. That's actually material. Yeah. And so I had to really look deep inside myself. And had I not, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So you worked hard at it. You really realized it. And I love what you say about how self compassion and self esteem are different. And we'll talk about that in just a second, because that's another kind of myth about self compassion is that it's synonymous with self-esteem and seeing that self-esteem didn't give you self-compassion. I realized that my quote unquote love or compassion was again, just I had to be deserving of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, that deep love is you are inherently, you are inherently lovable. You are inherently loved. And it's a hard practice because most love is extremely conditional, even from parents. If you get good grades, you'll be loved. Yeah. If you behave, you'll be loved. You do the dishes. So it, it, we see it everywhere. I don't, yeah, I'm very curious about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, Anna, want to grab the mic? Yes. Um, so could you give us an example of what is lack of compassion for the self or yeah. lack of yeah. self-compassion? Yeah. Yeah. So some of us have a very, very harsh inner critic. Right. And fault finding to the extreme that if anyone in our life spoke to us the way our inner voice and our inner critic did, we would never speak to them ever again. And it's just this constant loop we have going in our mind all the time of what's wrong with you. You didn't do that right either. You're never going to amount to a thing. You can't do, you know, a lot of people have, I mean, That's a lot of nice. <laughs> what is what yours you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's usually unprintable words yeah. in there. Yeah. 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 For a lot of people, for some people, it's almost constant. For other people, it just comes from time to time. And it's very interesting. There's a, there's a, 
I mentioned his name earlier when I talked about the three emotional regulation systems of drive, threat, and soothe, Paul Gilbert, this researcher in the UK. And he talks about the evolution of self-criticism. And I found this fascinating and it helped so much because he said, we have that because we're trying to fit in. And he said, you're monitoring. He said, okay, think about our evolutionary past. And I know this is debatable, but most, most people think we evolved and we evolved all of our emotional systems for a small interrelated tribe or clan or band of 100 or 150 people that we'd see in our whole lives. Like we only interacted with like 100 or 150 people. And there was a hierarchy because in every human culture, mostly there's some sort of hierarchy. And so to figure out where we fit, we had this inner voice trying to help us so that we wouldn't, and I always think of the middle school lunchroom. <laughs> so there you are standing with your tray. If you go sit with those super cool kids and you're not one of them, you're just gonna get humiliated. They're gonna be like, what? <laughs> but you don't wanna to totally sit with all the nerds at the bottom, cause then you're gonna get branded a nerd. So there you are and you're scanning and you're like, where, where do I fit enough? I'm not gonna get the humiliating slap down or, you know, I'm just gonna self, put myself in the bottom of the heap. So, I mean, to me, I was like, oh my God. So he said, it's trying to help us because mostly we figured it out once and then we didn't really have to do a lot. The way we live now, we have to figure it out every, like a million times a day. So you're walking into a thing and you're like, she's skinnier than me. Oh, look at those shoes. Oh, nah, 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 nah. Right? because we do it constantly because we don't have any stability in our social structures. So Kristen Neff, who also does a lot of teaching on self-compassion, she says, just speak to it and go, honey, I know you're trying to help me. Thank you so much, but I've got this. You don't have to do this. But to me, it helps so much to hear where that came from and how so much of the time it can be totally on overdrive just because of the way we live in a way that our emotional life didn't evolve to deal with the situations that we're in at all now, you know, so it, it actually evolved to help us. So that's the positive side. And that is the opposite of self-compassion is that constant harping kind of critical voice, right? And so self-compassion, and let's look, I'm going to share one screen because I've got a slide with so many things. And that's such a great question. So some, some of the five myths of self-compassion, that it's a form of self-pity. Okay, so not self-pity, self-compassion, just like compassion for others is not the same as pity. And we just talked about that, right? So that it's not self-pity, not being sorry for yourself. It's not weakness. And this is another thing that makes us shy away. And it's, it, yeah, we'll talk about this in a minute. So it doesn't mean that you're being weak. It just means that you're being, as Kristen Neff says, as kind to yourself as you would be to your best friend if they were going through whatever you were going through. That's all in the same kind of kind voice. So when we're trying to work on self-compassion and we'll do a practice in a minute, one of the instructions is, if it's really hard for you to find self-compassionate language. Imagine that best friend going through a struggle. And what would you say to them? Probably not. Oh, you are such a loser. You are never going to amount to anything. What is wrong with you? Yeah, you would lose friends fast. But that's what we say to ourselves. Macy's is even more unkind. We're not going to ask her to say what her self-talk says. Right. Oh, you know, it's so funny with the self-talk. So I always tell the story. Some of you have heard me say this before. I was living in New Zealand for a number of years. This is like 2008 or something. And I was asked to do a workshop for people who suffered from depression and anxiety. 
And I don't know why I said yes. I'm not a psychotherapist at all, but I was like, okay. I just like did this like mishmash of Buddhist meditation and like California workshoppy, you know, group process skills and kind of invented this weekend workshop. And at one point I did this thing I made and it was all women with one brave man. Like it wasn't actually advertised as a women's anxiety depression so there's one man and all these women and at one point i had them for 15 minutes write down their self-talk just sit there in silence and write down what they were saying and then i made them pair up and read it out loud (laughs) you have never seen such fear in the room and within like a minute they were laughing so hard because when you actually say it out loud It's so ridiculous. So they were howling. They were like literally rolling on the floor. After that session, they went out in the parking lot. They were like capering around and giggling. But they walked into the workshop like, and I was like, that's cool. That really worked. I had no idea. But it's so ridiculous that when you have to say it out loud to someone else, you know, and I didn't let them know, it was probably not very trauma informed that I didn't let them know that that was what they were going to do with the list. But it's not weakness, it's kindness, you know, it's just the same kind of kindness you would have. And it doesn't make us complacent. Another myth about self compassion is we need that harshness as a motivator. Right. And we would never do anything if we didn't have that voice going, you idiot, you're, you don't know anything. Right. And Kristen Neff again has another thing that she says is she's like, okay, you have the middle school student, you know, who's comes home with a failing math grade. What's going to encourage them more? If you say all those harsh, horrible things, you're failing, you're a disaster. Or if you say to them, we'll get through this together. I'll get you a tutor. It's going to be okay. What do you think, right? So that's going to be more encouraging and the same with us. So we don't need it to motivate. In fact, she says, and she's done a lot of research on this too, that that harsh criticism actually is really discouraging and not motivating at all. So the myth that it will make us a couch potato or somehow complacent also And then self-compassion is the same as self-esteem. And so self-esteem is still dependent on some kind of accomplishment, right? We have high self-esteem because we're talented, because we're accomplished, because we got promoted. And so just because we're human and we deserve it because we're human beings and all beings are deserving of kindness and compassion, that's all. So the, you know, modern psychology is kind of falling out of love with the idea of self-esteem as any kind of benchmark of healthy psychological functioning, because it is so conditional and so dependent on, you know, some sort of accomplishment. So it's not the same as self-esteem. And self-compassion is selfish, right? Also not at all it just in the same way that talking to a friend and showing kindness would be somehow you know making them arrogant or like giving them too much attention or something like that self-compassion isn't selfish one of my students and it was really interesting the student who's taken the eight-week compassion training with me i think two or three times he keeps coming back for more (laughs) And I remember during this week, and he was talking about the gender binary, and of course, like not everybody fits into the binary, but when we're talking about these myths of self-compassion, he said, oh, the obstacle for men is they think self-compassion is weakness. The obstacle for women are they think self-compassion is selfish. And I thought that was kind of an interesting insight. He was like, because I was talking about the selfishness obstacle, and he's like, that's not what it is for me. I think... I'm going to be weak. So interesting to kind of investigate a little bit, you know. Jorge, grab the mic. Um, So um, is selfishness 
is it not exactly um how to say this not exactly bad because we're like i mean in order to be a buddhist you have to be a little selfish you have to it's about me say more about uh, okay so um okay la, last week i had a bad experience with this guy and um he wants to come to my house and tries to get high not happening and um not in my house yeah yeah so i had to kick him out yeah 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 that's yeah. being selfish no it's having a compassionate boundary dude okay boundary but it was based on me no it's based on wisdom i think right like you don't want to be around that kind of behavior right. How are you going to be able to benefit anyone if you get all tangled up in some kind of nonsense that you don't want okay. to be tangled up in? So setting an appropriate boundary about other people's behavior, because you too need to function and we know what we can handle and what we can't. And I think having a boundary of like, no, that's not okay. And it's kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, like, we can have compassion to the person. I'm sure with this person, you didn't like get enraged and say, I hate you and no, no, no. harm you at all. But you're just like, this is the boundary about what happens in my house. And you just overstepped. So you're invited to leave right now. You know, it's interesting. A friend and I developed this whole course we called Compassionate Boundaries for exactly this reason. Okay. Because for so many people, they think it's not okay to say no to some kind of dysfunctional behavior if you're trying to be a compassionate person. Okay. But I don't see that as selfish. I just see that as taking care of yourself in a wise, healthy way so that you can keep showing up for other people okay. and don't go down the slippery slope. Okay, so I, I get this idea, as you know, for all the many years that I took self-help groups, and yeah. that was one thing that they were always pressed on us that it's okay to be selfish. I would, I still think that's not, I wouldn't use the word selfish for this. For me, selfish is like that incredible self-absorption and self-preoccupation that everything's all about you and you're nobody else is even on the radar. That wasn't happening in that situation. That was just a healthy boundary. Okay. To me, selfishness is just that it's all about me and I don't care about anybody else's thing at all. It's not taking care of yourself in a wise way. No, okay. We need to do that. And, you know, how can we even help other beings if we're not taking care of ourselves in a way that's wise and appropriate? We have to. And remember the balance of like equalizing ourselves and others, right? We, we have to have this kind of self-compassion that says, I need a healthy environment around me, just like you need to eat healthy food and put healthy food in your body. You need healthy behavior around you in order to thrive too. And there's nothing selfish about that. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that some programs call it selfishness because I would really disagree with that okay. label. Okay, so that, that's, that, that's that yeah, sense? it's, I mean, you're pretty much saying the same thing, just don't call it selfishness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. it's really important what you say, too, because some people think, oh, when I'm a, a, trying to be a compassionate person, I have to do everything everybody wants me to do at all times and can never say no. And that's just idiot compassion, right? Mm -hmm. So like knowing when the wise thing is to say no, and it doesn't mean that you're being a doormat and just letting people walk all over you and just doing all kinds of dysfunctional things just because they ask you to and they want you to. And to me, that's the perfect example of what happened in your apartment. You're like, no, my apartment is a clean space where this isn't going to be happening. And just said, you know, being clear about that. Yeah. You didn't harm him. There's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. That was a great example. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I would love for you to speak a little, if I, I missed the morning, so you maybe already did yeah. about fierce compassion. Yeah. So I like to think about, and I, in my work with mental health, with teens and adults, I always say compassion is more often the word no than it is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's far more often the word no. And the, like, and that also it's not about helping people get what they want. 
it's about in doing a deeper inquiry into needs. So like when I ask myself, what's the most compassionate thing, like is staying up all night on my phone compassionate? I might want that. Right, right, right. And there might be a part of my nervous system that thinks that that's soothing and maybe temporarily is, but it is not what I need. I need sleep. I need to stay off the machine. So the note, like there's just so much for me where I am in my life, like compassion is far more often no than yes. Yeah. And I think a lot about the fierce takinis and the fierce, you know, like yeah. the images of some of the Tibetan deities are wearing like skin around their neck and standing <laughs> on, right. Yeah. They're not, and but they are wildly compassionate beings. Yeah. Um, I don't really want to be slayed. Yeah. And that way illusions do. Yes. Or you want your yes, I do. Yeah. And I'm yeah. still so <laughs> blended with my delusions that I think it's me, yeah, but you know, so the images help me. And so I think like, I really think that our culture in particular, I'm just going to say Western American white yeah. culture. Cause I don't know about others. Like we think that compassion. So a sixth myth for me is that compassion is boundaryless. Yeah. 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 Which you said you had the compassion boundaries class, which yeah, is so cool. Right, so right, I just right. think like, I need to hear no all the time. And everyone in my life knows that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's why, I mean, these myths, it's so important. And that is another one. And it is sometimes why people hesitate to even do a compassion training. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to have to say yes to every ask that anyone asked of me all the yeah. time forevermore and it's like it's like our concentric circle of our energy and what's sustainable so people ask a lot of our energy and sometimes we just say you know what I just can't show up in that way or especially if it's not good for them I mean compassion means we're blending the wisdom of like what's best for everyone in this situation and sitting around and letting a bunch of people get high in your apartment isn't good for anybody in the situation. So saying a hard no there or whatever the equivalent would be is really important. Like thinking of thinking of others' welfare, like May says, often is. I mean, I had a student who I would only see every once in a while. This is years ago, you know, and he would come to me and he would have done all kinds of crazy stuff. And I knew he could handle it and he kind of needed it. So I'd yell at him and he'd be like, God, you're so harsh. You're just so mean. But I knew for that student, he sort of needed to be like smacked around a little bit. Whereas like for somebody else who's more fragile, I never would have said the same, you know, but it's like, so gauging too. And in, in Buddhist teaching, they say, as a teacher, you start with the sweet words and then you sort of like hook them in and then you start like laying down the law. And so sometimes like, treat, you know, telling people that their behavior is not okay, after like you have the relationship and it all depends on the relationship like how do you set a boundary there isn't some like recipe cookbook thing it all depends how you do it on the relationship that you have but yeah it's definitely not rolling over to every request that anyone makes of you at all yeah yeah <laughs> And you might be able to sit up here. I don't know if anybody. Oh, else that's okay. I love sitting up <laughs> by the door. Um, I was going to say that I feel like we're talking about sort of self compassion in, in the context of that. And I also feel like it's deeply compassionate to let other people experience the consequences of their behavior. Um, and I see this, I used to see this a lot when I worked with um, substance use. Um, people who are addicted and there would be a lot of history of people trying to sort of protect them and, you know, bail them out and, yeah. and, you yeah. know, hide the alcohol and whatever. And, and it, all it did was it actually escalated. It made things worse and that it was a deeply compassionate act for somebody to say, no, you can't come in the house because then they, this person had to find themselves lying in the gutter and thinking about the choices that they made and what brought them there yeah. as opposed to being sheltered from them. And so I was, I always, I mean, when I appreciate you talking about fierce compassion, because I was, that's what it came up for me is that this is a fierce action yeah, and it's actually a deeply compassionate action because then this person has the opportunity to experience the reality right. that they've right. created for themselves in a certain way. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you yeah, for sure. sharing that. Yeah. It's really true. Yeah. So self-compassion, none of these things 
the same kind of kindness and compassion that we would have towards a good friend. And it is hard. It is really hard. And to me, almost making friends with my harsh inner critic and realizing its goal was to help me helped it shut up for me a lot. Like I it was able to take a rest because I had acknowledged it and appreciated it and said, you know, I know you're just trying to help, but I don't need you right now. Like I don't need your voice constantly doing it. So it was able, it was, it wasn't that it wasn't there anymore at all, but it was able to just, you know, be on the back burner more and not so much in the forefront. And it's a, it's a challenge, just like with the concentric circles, our self-compassion practice develops over time too. It's not like flipping a switch. <laughs> so, is, is this voice that we hear that we tell ourselves uh, our critic is this our um our wounded child you know it's it, we all have it we all have it and then i think there are ways that if we have experienced some kind of trauma as children it can get even more loud and distorted for sure if those were also external messages that we heard all the time from others that were bad that were awful but like we have it as a gauge in to see like to help us fit in and also for sure, you know, if there were things that happened that made us feel unsafe or we heard those messages externally our whole lives or our whole childhood, then it's really harder to uproot because we, I mean, I found for myself in my own kind of journey and, and at a certain point I realized, oh, that's my dad's voice. And I was able to actually hear it almost in his voice. I was like, that's all the stuff I take, took on from the way he would talk to me. And luckily before he died, we were able to work it out. And he was like, I was just trying to help you and thought I was being a good dad. And I was like, well, the way I experienced it is I can never do anything right. You know, but when I was able to even identify it oh that's where it comes from and then get some separation so i think for sure if that's what we've heard a lot it's harder to to counter and uproot but not impossible not impossible at all yeah okay yeah thank you but it's not only people who've heard that a lot externally because it's just something that we evolved so that we would fit because the human need for belonging is so fundamental. I mean, there's one, actually, she's a social worker that works a lot with, with trauma and abuse survivors. And she talks about, and I love her short list because then nonviolent communication, there's all these long lists of feelings and needs. And her short list of fundamental needs are safety, belonging, and respect. And I really like that as a short list because I've even looked at the whole NBC long list and I've, they all kind of fit under those headings, right? Of safety, belonging, and dignity or respect. Who is this? Important? It's Stacey Haynes is her name. Cool. And I, yeah, and I love her work. And belonging, because often when I look at some of my most dysfunctional behavior, I think, I just wanted to belong. Yeah. Like it was just some trying to fulfill that need to belong somehow. So it's there to belong. And it can be, like I said, so distorted depending on what our childhood experiences have been too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I do appreciate your example or your question, Jorge. And um, it sounded to me that when you did what you did with your friend, it was about your, your safety and respect for you yeah. and your home, right? So uh, I think we have uh, an idea in Buddhist teaching that our, our home is kind of a sacred place. Mm. I mean, oftentimes we do invite the deities to come into our home and sometimes we ask them to come and stay and, and they do right so you're kind of sensitive to that right yeah this is my home this is my sacred space and um i need to be safe and i need others to respect otherwise you know the boundaries are 
yeah. can be violated. So, um, yeah, I think that's and it's okay good. for us to get what we need. Just to mm -hmm. say, look, it's really okay for us to get what we need. Because remember, we're equal to all sentient beings. And so getting our needs for safety and belonging and respect or dignity met, totally worthy of that. Not harming others in the service of that, that's all. We're not harming others, but setting a clear boundary. Like we are worthy of all of that care and respect just because we're human beings. So not to think that we, ours needs to come the leftovers at the end of the line. And yeah, how can we flourish if our needs aren't being met? I mean, the whole thing of like, even our spiritual practice, and I see people in spiritual spaces going to this extreme of like, oh, no, I won't worry. I'll serve everyone else first. And then they're so kind of exhausted and miserable and not getting their needs met. And it's like, if we're actually going to become fully awakened, which is kind of the goal of Buddhism, whether you call it liberation or enlightenment, we need certain conditions to be fulfilled. So if in the short term, it means closing the door and keeping people out so we can have a safe place to do our practice or whatever, the whole point of doing that is to be able to then show up for the whole world, no less than the whole world. So in the short term, we might need to take care of a lot of things for ourselves because it means I'm gonna then be resourced enough with all these qualities that I've developed, you know, in long retreat, like I remember when I went into long meditation retreat and people were like, isn't that selfish? And I was like, dude, you try being alone in a year in the middle of the desert for three years, three months and three days. I couldn't have done that if I hadn't been doing it for others. If it had been about me, I would have been, I'm fine. Really, I'm okay. I don't need to go sweat in the desert for three years. It was only for the sake of others, right? So for us, that's a lot of, you know, taking care of our needs for the greater good of all beings, you know? So thinking of that, reminding ourselves of that, when we have the voice that says, is this selfish? Which is a good question to ask, but, you know, often not at all. Yeah. Okay. Da, 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 we can do this. All right. So what I would love to do now is a little exercise that is a self-kindness exercise. And we're going to do this in mostly in pairs. You don't have to get organized into pairs yet. I'll introduce the exercise. And Brendan, we have an odd number of people on Zoom. I might ask you to pair up with a Zoom person. Would that work? Oh, Great. Yeah. So the way this works, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you didn't need to go. <laughs> so the way this exercise works, it's a self-appreciation exercise. And we do this, some of you have done various versions of this with me before. There's a way that if we appreciate ourselves, it's actually empowering and allows us to be more connected to others. There's an exercise we won't do today about contemplating our core values and really attuning to what are our core values in life. And so that's one way of doing it. The one that we're going to do now, and I'll share the screen, and it's very specific, and we'll do this Again, in pairs, except now, I think in the room, we might have one group of three, so we'll have to adjust the time in just a little bit. And so in this self-appreciation exercise, the person with the longest hair will be person A, and then after a couple of minutes, we'll switch. So person A, your script is very simple and you do not deviate from the script. You ask the person with the shorter hair, please tell me one thing you appreciate about yourself. And person B responds and you say, thank you. You don't say, oh yeah, me too. And then I remember when I did that thing, you just say thank you. And then you repeat the question. Please tell me one thing you appreciate about yourself. You can repeat it in a different way. Please tell me something else you, repeat, you appreciate about yourself. But basically, repeating the question, person B will respond. You say, thank you. You repeat the question until I ring the bell. Okay? And then you'll switch. 
And then the person with the shortest hair is person A. Please tell me one thing you appreciate. Person B. <laughs> Let's say on his hair on the top, not on the sides. <laughs> And then thank you like that. So it's not a conversation. It's just repeating the questions over and over until I ring the bell. Then you will have a couple of minutes at the end with your pair to talk about what it felt like to be asked and to be able to respond like that. But don't converse during the exercise. Clear. So I want to guide you through, and this is the practice. I'm going to share one slide to introduce you. This is a practice that Kristen Neff, and I mentioned her name, she wrote actually a book called Simply Self-Compassion. And she has a website that has a lot of good resources. I don't know if it's selfcompassion.org or .com, but if you just Google Kristen Neff, yeah, yeah. Chris Annie FF is her last name. Oh, it's right there. So her self-compassion break, and it's called a break. We have longer self-compassion meditations, but this one I love because it's like the go-to that you can do kind of anywhere. We're going to do it as a seated contemplation, but it's something that you can just do when you feel that you need that self-compassion break. And so the first step is mindfulness of suffering. And as we said earlier in the day, when we're talking about the definition of compassion, you know, compassion can be challenging because it requires an awareness of suffering either in yourself or in others. So that's the loving kindness piece for some people is easier because it's like, oh, I want them to be happy. Let's all be happy. Isn't that nice? And the compassion really involves that empathetic connection to another suffering. And in this case, including our own. So not being in denial about our own experience, you know, not wallowing, but just again, the clear seeing of like, yeah, this is, this is a moment of it's heart for me right now. And so what we do in the meditation is actually say those words to ourselves. Wow. I'm really going through a struggle right now. This is really hard for me right now, whatever words work for us. And then the common humanity, and this is a piece that we'll look at after the break, because this is the way that we also extend our compassion to others. But in terms of giving ourselves compassion, interestingly enough, an awareness of how many other people experience the same thing as us, in this case, isn't overwhelming, it's connecting and soothing. So we think, whatever I'm going through, so many other people are going through it right now. I'm not alone. This is what it is to be human. The Buddha wouldn't have come up with the Four Noble Truths. And the first one is like, we are subject to suffering from time to time when the causes and conditions come together. This is what it's like. I'm not alone. Because it's the isolation often of our experience that can just make it so much worse. So connecting weirdly is helpful instead of overwhelming. And then the last piece is self-kindness. And I mentioned before, you know, we can choose to talk to ourselves in the same tone of voice that we would give to a good friend that was going through some suffering. Like this week, my friend and her daughter losing their dad and husband. You know, I wasn't like, come on, pull it together. I was like saying all the kindest, nicest noises because they were in deep suffering right now. So like, meeting yourself with that same energy that we meet, you know, a dear friend who's really struggling right now in all of that kind way. One thing that Kristen Neff says, and this is something that's actually sort of physiological, she says, giving compassion to yourself. It's like this recursive reciprocal thing that can feel kind of weird. So she says it actually helps if you touch yourself in some way, a typical thing is putting one hand or both hands on your chest. I have a Eve Ekman, who I teach this kind of stuff with a lot. Like Eve loves the thing of just kind of holding her shoulders, like giving yourself a hug. I had a student when I lived in Canada and she would pop her, she had grandchildren. So this was a soothing gesture for her because I think she did that with her grandchildren and just cupping her face kind of tenderly. So this can help us get that relationship with ourselves, creating almost like a subject object thing with the touch can be helpful. So I'll invite you to do that if it feels comfortable. 
So I'll guide you through this practice and then we'll have our final break and then our final piece, which is extending to others, which is a lifelong quest. So from now for forever, we'll do the last piece. So again, this will be just a 10 minute, really brief practice, getting yourself into your seat, relaxing the body, getting that nice upright spine, the body relaxed around with it, your shoulders even, your hands resting in your lap, your eyes can either be open or in a hooded gaze or closed completely. And they're settling with the breath for a few moments. And then choosing a real situation in your life right now that's causing you some difficulty and something that's maybe about a three or four on a scale of one to 10. So not the most difficult thing, just something that's mildly to moderately difficult. Thinking of that situation and if there are a couple of different things that come to mind, just pick one thing for the purpose of this meditation. And then just take a few moments to really think about in your mind, what's the storyline? What's happening? Who's involved in the situation? Really draw from memory to flesh out the experience a little bit of like what is going on there? Who's involved? And you might feel a little bit of tension arising. One of the triggers for emotion is memory. So as you bring this situation to mind, you might notice a little bit of activation going on. And as you're thinking about this situation and getting in touch with some of the feelings and some of the stress involved around it, I'm going to drop some phrases into your awareness and just repeat these phrases to yourself. And so the first step is thinking that this is a moment of suffering. And what we're doing here is just bringing mindful awareness to the fact but this is really hard right now. So using some language that reminds ourselves, that validates that this is difficult, this is hard, this is stressful. So it might be, yeah, I'm really going through it right now. This is really hard right now. Feeling a lot of stress. Whatever language works for you, really bringing that mindful awareness being careful not to be overwhelmed or flooded, but that's why we picked something that's mild or moderate. And then the second piece is remembering that suffering is a part of life. This is the common humanity. It's not abnormal to suffer, to experience difficulty. Suffering is a part of life. So use words that speak to you. I'm not alone in this suffering. 
This is a part of our shared humanity. Whatever gives you an idea that our interconnectedness, that we're all in this together on some level, this is part of what we all share. This is our common humanity. And then the last component is self-kindness. May I be kind to myself? Then you can adopt one of the soothing gestures, either one hand or both hands on your heart or cupping your face or maybe giving yourself a hug if that seems like something you'd like to try. And speaking to yourself in some kind words. May I be kind to myself in this moment can even say something like, I'm here for you, or I care about you. I'm sorry you're suffering. Some language that feels natural that expresses your care towards yourself. And if it's hard to come up with language, just imagining again, if you had a good friend that was going through the same kind of distress that you're going through now, what would you say to your dear friend? I'm here for you, I care about you, whatever language feels right. Really trying to extend that same kindness to yourself. Okay, hmm. that felt really good. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> okay, we've got just over an hour left, and I want to do a piece about extending compassion to others and another contemplation. Let's take a break for about is seven minutes enough. So let's start looking at extending compassion to others. So it's a big topic. We'll just start with a taster. And so what we'll do, we'll talk about kind of the philosophy behind it. And then we'll do another interactive exercise again in pairs this time. One group of three. And I know it's kind of awkward to have like the other configurations. But let's look at extending and what the basis of extending compassion to others. I'm going to share my screen. Again, and so we say part of cultivating compassion to other for others is looking at the basic similarity between oneself and others. And this is a really important piece of it. And this is what we were talking about before, the common humanity. 
-hmm. right? Just that thing that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, my teacher, and, you know, for many years, always says the same thing. The minute he opens his mouth, no matter what the context of the teaching, he mostly always says, all beings are the same in wanting happiness and wanting to avoid suffering, and that we're all the same. And that's it, the basic similarity. Doesn't mean our behavior is the same. Doesn't mean our background is the same. It doesn't mean our lived experience is the same. We're not trying to erase the real differences that are there in our lived experiences due to all kinds of factors, race, class, gender, you know, socioeconomic status, all of that. But it's just saying, you know, in that Stacey Haynes, three basic needs that I just mentioned, like all humans need safety, belonging and respect or dignity. And there's a short list of what is the same, but it's the most fundamental pieces. So connecting with that, connecting with that, that basic similarity and that we all want happiness and want to avoid suffering. And one of the things that's really helped me so much in Buddhist practice, and I was having a discussion about this the other day with someone, and one of the insights for me was, you know, many religious traditions have a dichotomy of good and evil. So there's good people and there's evil people. And in Buddhism, we talk more about ignorance and wisdom, mm. right? So when people are doing things that are really harmful or behaving in destructive ways, in Buddhism, we say they're deeply ignorant about the causes of happiness and suffering, and they're creating the causes of even more suffering for themselves. So for me, that idea from Buddhism, which we don't have in in CCT, but I'm teaching it at a Buddhist center, so I figure it's okay to mention the B word from time to time. You know, but that's the idea is it's delusion and ignorance that's making people behave in these ways that are harmful, not that they're evil by nature. Other people disagree. I was disagreeing with a friend this week. She's like, no, there are people that are evil. And I'm like, no, I don't. That's just not my philosophy and my view, you know, and that everybody is, you know, deserving of happiness and deserving of freedom from suffering. Whether they're going to be able to get that in this life or not, that's another whole question. And for sure, like I said before, the boundary of preventing harm, right, if out of their delusion, the way that they're trying to attain happiness is by harming others. And of course, you have to take sometimes the fierce compassionate action to prevent the harm of others. But with that understanding, you know, that at, at that root, we're all the same. And then appreciation of others through recognition of our interconnection. And that's one of the things I think for like European American white dominant culture. I mean, we are totally the worst in terms of our individualistic thing. We think that we're just a satellite floating in midair, totally disconnected to anything else. I do this meditation. I like to lead a meditation on interconnection and go, I couldn't even get a drink of water if it weren't for other people. I don't know how the plumbing works. I don't even know where the water comes from. No way could I do it and get the, yeah, I can't just turn on the faucet and the water comes in. It's, it's all about me. And it's like, dude, seriously, like nothing that I use, nothing that I do is any, I can't even grow. I mean, I can't really grow food. I can barely grow house plants. It's only the kind that will never die. Like that Ivy thing up there that you can ignore for five years. Like if it were up to like feeding myself in any way, shape or form, I'd be a lot skinnier than I am now. Let's just, say, you know, so really having, a, you know, everything we do depends on others, right? Whether we know them, whether we like them, whether they're our friend, we're all so interconnected. And so developing that awareness. And then out of all of that comes this sense of, Loving empathic concern, like anyone could be flourishing if they had the right conditions. And could we be part of creating that for someone, you know? So that is sort of the philosophy behind. It doesn't need to be the comfort zone of just our loved ones. We can expand that out to others. 
And there's some obstacles to that. And I want to just present to you, this is something that I sometimes do in a, in a bigger exercise where I actually, if people are in a room together, I have people stand in a circle and then take a step forward if they can relate to any of the obstacles to extending compassion to others. So I've mentioned Paul Gilbert a couple of times. He wrote a paper and has done research on what he calls fears of compassion. And I, in my kind of Buddhist language, translate that to obstacles of compassion. And he talks about obstacles to extending compassion to others, obstacles for self-compassion, and obstacles for even receiving compassion from others, because we haven't even talked about that, right? And that's something that sometimes it's really hard for us to allow other people to be kind and compassionate to us. I was teaching a course a number of years ago, and there were a lot of young people who had experienced a lot of trauma and abuse, uh, you know, when they were younger. And it was such a struggle for them to receive compassion and to even imagine a figure giving them compassion because they never actually experienced that in their lives. So it was really quite triggering and we had to go very slowly in that step. And that's one of the things we do in the longer course for self-compassion. We imagine a compassionate image giving us compassion in the longer course. And for a lot of these kids, it just brought up so much sadness because they were like the person that was supposed to do that for me never showed up for me in that way right so that's another obstacle we have i want to just go through some of these challenges to extending compassion to others and what i'll do because we're kind of running short of time and i want to do another contemplation what i'll do i'll go through i have a slide We'll just look at each one of these, and I just invite you to feel the felt sense that you feel when I'll, I'll read them out loud and show them on the screen. You don't have to turn around and look necessarily. You could just listen to me. What I have people do when we're in a group is get in a circle and take a step forward. If there's anything they resonate with, it's just a felt sense of like, oh, yeah, that's so it sort of normalizes. These are some of the things. These are some of the reasons we're not already Mother Teresa, if we're not, right? Like, yeah, it's hard. That's why we're here. That's why we're in the training, right? So this is from Paul Gilbert. And then we'll just see, you know, see if anybody has some comments of what might have come up for you. So Paul from Paul Gilbert's list. And I'll just pause after each one and see what it feels like. People will take advantage of me if they see me as too compassionate. There are some people in life who don't deserve compassion. I fear that being too compassionate makes people an easy target. People will take advantage of you if you're too forgiving and compassionate. I worry that if I'm compassionate, vulnerable people can be drawn to me and drain my emotional resources. People need to help themselves rather than waiting for others to help them. For some people, I think discipline and proper punishments are more helpful than being compassionate to them. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that Paul Gilbert found in his research as being common obstacles to extending compassion for others. Anybody resonate with any of those or a couple of them? Maybe yes. sometimes all of them. Yeah, Jorge, grab the mic, grab the mic. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about this is that I, that I worry for... Um, 
the last one and the one that says where you, you keep on forgiving people will take advantage of you. Yeah. And the last one was also um, um, sometimes I do feel that some people just deserve discipline, punishment, and yeah, and it's just like uh, even though I I think that way. I don't feel that way. Ah, uh, uh, say but, more about that. Well, it's it's like a, it's like I have an inner struggle. Uh, Sometimes uh, what I think and what I feel are two different things, mm -hmm. and but um, and sometimes I let my thoughts win. Yeah. And sometimes I go with my feelings, but um, that's the the last one. Is like yeah. Sometimes you just gotta. You know, yeah. make an example of somebody, or yeah, you can't have them just stepping all over you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any other reflections on that list? Yeah, me. I I almost see them in like two groups, uh -huh. right? There's a like I'll be taken advantage of, it, or if it's too soft and fuzzy, and then there's the group of like the good bad binary like yeah. there's bad people and they need to be dealt with in a particular way and i'm like i felt a real sort of tightening to see that i'm sort of in the latter group uh, you know that that my conditioning of my culture and privilege and 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 particularly like i'm seeing as a white bodied person how i make certain other white people the bad people mm. and like really separate myself from them like yeah. for example certain people in a different political party, right? Like yeah. those aren't like, they are the bad people and they are the scary people and don't do any. And, and they, and there's a big part of me that's like, and they do deserve to be punished. Mm, in fact, yeah. maybe just dissipated off the planet and to just like find that so that that doesn't make me any different from them. Yeah. 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 Cause they want me to be dissipated off the planet. So like, it's just a really interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. recognition and there's a lot of charge in it. Um, and to think of like, I would think that I would fall on that side of being the overly fuzzy, vulnerable but I don't. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's super interesting. You know, I have cheerful. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how oh, it's interesting. Like I find that for me, I'm more judgy at the people that are more like me that I want to do better than I am of other groups of people. It's like, I'm way more judgy of like white progressives of my generation and i'm like y'all haven't we been through the same thing like really we're still doing this you know i can be way more judgy whereas i'm much less judgy about and it's like the identification and maybe the shame of like my people are doing this thing that's like so so i i've really had to look at that and just go ooh, like that charge is there more because i identify you know, with this group or somehow, yeah, what just expect more. And like, come on, y'all, let's get it together. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That thing. That thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But I love what you say about like, yeah, we think we're all warm and fuzzy, but we're actually like the inner judgy, like person and then you find that one and you're like oh no one was in there i thought it was like super nice no yeah yeah you yeah for me there's like gradations of the people need to help themselves like and these other these support groups that i'm part of you know it's like these support groups that sure remain nameless <laughs> Or I, I'm not really part of those support groups anymore, but I I can recite lots of things. But so she provides people the foundation to help themselves. But then I start thinking about all oh, of this codependency thing where I think San Francisco is people, you know, it's like a public health crisis, people on dope. Um, damn it, you know, they have to decide that they're going to get help. I mean, so it's, yeah, it's a complicated uh, bullet point for me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I, I, it's a bit of a, like a word game 
Um, for me, because and I think I came into this with a little bit more of like compassion is like a uh, like a view, you know, a sort of an openness to like that people could change or that, you know, that they need support or they need to be, you know, you need to take in like background and, you know, circumstances and so forth. And uh, and so like. So I, I, I kind of disagree with the statements as they're as they're written, but on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe I would like throw in the word support or something to make it fit with kind of my worldview. Like yeah. people need yeah. support, yeah. and and people are dangerous. Yeah. You know, people are dangerous to themselves, and they're dangerous to others. Are they evil? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's just sort of a weird distinction to me. It's like, oh, this person's like rotten to their core. They might be like permanently dangerous, yeah. but, yeah. you know, do they not deserve compassion? No, they do, right. you know, for their suffering. And then, you know, my particular flavor, as long as we're just, you know, openly hating on folks. Yeah, I, I would, I would just, I, there's a particular like, um, you know, just particular delusions, you know, that, that I think are just misguided stuff that gets on my nerves um, and where I think like support can look different and and we can have a we can have a conversation about that versus like, you know, anything but open drug markets and, you know, like just uh, whatever the, the opportunity, you know, a lifestyle of living on the street. Uh, you know, whatever. I think it's misguided. Is it? It's also frustrating. And then on an individual level, yeah. I mean, if I can, I'll then I will just hit on like you're lost, and yeah. I can, and I can't even reach you as a human because I because I if I haven't been there, I've been close enough to know that like you're you're lost. And uh, you know, if I remind myself of something of that at least with, you know, maybe drug addicts or whatever, um, I, I would help me to have compassion is just to like, you know, this is heartbreaking. That's why, that's why this is so difficult. Yeah. You know, if I'm not afraid of you, I'm just like, yeah. God, like, and you, and like, even if I go to you and tell you, like, it just doesn't have to be like this. I, I you know, I just have this belief. I'm not going to get through to yeah. the part of them that recognizes like the needlessness of the suffering. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think this, like what this is really bringing up and even this list of the obstacles is how complex and acting compassionate action really is like in, like, like I said, that's a whole nother story what do we do you know these are more of the attitudes that can block us even wanting to have compassion but then if you have compassion to someone who is dangerous what does that look like like what do you what does it look like in terms of your action right so i think even what this is sort of bringing up in just focusing momentarily on these phrases is wow, it's super complex. And do you have people with a mental health crisis? Are you prepared to deal with that? Like most of us aren't. Like we wouldn't even know the right thing to do unless we have that specific, you know, Mace has that training. Like some people have that training and a lot of us don't. And so even trying to intervene, like it doesn't mean that compassion means we just ride up on the white horse's savior in every situation. We can't. Yeah. So, yeah. That, and, and that's to minimize like the truth, you know, the complexity of the suffering, right? It's yeah. not just as simple as like yeah. they're now an adult and I could love them into because I've been down that road. I'm going to love this addict into uh, remission or whatever. That doesn't work. That's that's feeding into the delusion. They actually need to be sober yeah. and then, you know, and in, in a loving way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah. you know, I struggle with like narcissists and people that with the ego and the that, and, you know, my work around versus, you know, I, I can't really go to like, Oh, there's a wounded child in there. Um, but I will go to like, they can't handle emotional pleas like yeah. that is a threat to them yeah and then i can get to compassion it's like that is frightening to them yeah. and, and i think we yeah have to but out. like what is the work around yeah the, the just psychologically you know that we can like connect with 
and realize it's such a process, like remembering the concentric circles model that we had before. And it's like little by little by little, and we have these views and it is really complicated and we're not gonna nail it in a six hour workshop by any means. And maybe it gives us, a, you know, a different perspectives on things in different ways to manage. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna do another contemplation this is going to be in pairs, and I think Elizabeth had to leave, so I think we actually have pairs now, and I will invite you, but not force you, to pick someone you haven't worked with yet today, and what you're going to be doing is facing each other, so move your chairs around, and Eleanor and Ramit, you're a pair again. Sorry that you don't get to mix up with other people. I'll put you in a breakout room after I've explained the the instructions so if you want to pick the person that you're with now and then i'll give the instruction and i will put the instructions in the chat for the two of you also so for the this is going to be a two-part practice one is going to happen oh oh jorge jorge still needs a partner where is we're right here. Yeah, and we have Tom up front. So are we good with our pairs? Sorry, we're taking a moment. So for the first part, and I'll put the instructions on the screen also for the people who are still here. So in pairs, so... Listen up to the instructions, they're here. The first part is an empathic attunement exercise. And then I'm gonna lead you through a contemplation after doing this. So the first one, the person, this time the person with the longest hair starts. So for three minutes, sharing about something you're having a difficulty with, a three to five on a scale of one to 10, the listener, for you as the listener, we talked about this before. This is a chance to practice that empathic attunement. Full attention without commentary. Maintaining a sense of being both connected and differentiated. So you're not merging with the suffering experience of the other person. You're attuning, but you're different. This is not your experience. You're not being flooded. You're not being overwhelmed. Stay grounded with your body and with your breath. For this one, you don't say anything for the three minutes. Use your body language, lean forward, make eye contact, show the listener or show the speaker that you're fully attuned. Then after three minutes, I'll ring the bell and I'll send a message into the Zoom room. Pause for a minute to breathe. And then I'll sw you'll switch. The other person will have three minutes to then share what's going on for them. And then the first person will be the listener for the three minutes. And then we'll come back to the big group and we'll go immediately into a contemplation that I'll guide you through. Thank you for sharing. And you know, that's the perfect kind of intro to kind of one of the final pieces of advice I wanted to share in these practices. I feel like for me, it's been a question of just fake it till you make it. Like, you just keep doing the practice. I mean, for me, there was a hard family member. And every time I try and do compassion practice with this person, I felt like it was just hitting a brick wall. And it literally took months and years. And then one meditation session, something had softened, like it works. You know, the practices work over time and you just trust the practice and keep doing it and don't expect quick results with the hard case of somebody using you as a penny. like of course and even the willingness to me there's so much power and even the willingness to hold those people with even a wish to feel like sometimes i feel like compassion isn't even the wish for them to be free of suffering it's just the wish for me to even be ready to try and be compassionate with them Awesome. That's a great starting point. Like even to want to do that instead of just retaliation, right? And just even having the thought of that, even if we don't succeed, like even having the thought of, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if it were heartfelt and trusting that through these practices, because for me, like I've been doing these practices for like over 30 years now. And like, 
I'll still get surprised at how I'll hear something and then my knee jerk instead of judgment is compassion, like finally after 30 plus years. But, you know, it'll surprise me because it's not even like I have to try. It's like the practice transform something so that even I'll hear something gnarly that someone did and I'll just be like whoa that must be such a wounded person instead of like oh, how dare they and they need to be locked up and throw away the key you know but it's only through so much of the practice there's this one Tibetan Buddhist teacher who died a number of years ago and his name was Chatu Tuku Rinpoche and I loved he had this metaphor of meditation it's like it's like pouring your mind through a filter over and over and over and first it filters out the really big chunks of delusion and then the more you pour it through it gets like finer and finer and finer and that's just you know, I think sometimes we're brainwashed by our educational system that says, oh, learn the equation and learn how to solve it and you're done. But that's not the way that inner transformation works. And even to be willing, in your case, to go, I'm going to check my reactive thing of wanting to pop in one and stop doing that. And I'm, it's still not heartfelt, but I'm willing to look at that. That's huge. That's just huge. So I think that would be, I mean, it's kind of my advice to all of you is here you've gotten a taster in six hours together and it's lifelong and lifetimes long. If you believe in the Buddhist view of things, you know, that this isn't going to be. And this stuff really does work, you know, if we just trust that every time we pour our mind through, and you're not going to see necessarily short term, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has a beautiful thing that he says, and he says, our attitude towards our practice, he goes, don't expect really quick results, because then you're going to be disappointed. Like, oh, I'm going to be fully compassionate by next Tuesday. Like, maybe not. And he says, also, like, so have in mind that it's a long term long range vision for our practice and look back six months a year two years if you're not changing at all there's also something wrong like yeah. we should be feeling incrementally more patient more kind less judgy more than that but just even a little bit right but not expecting quick and not expecting nothing he goes if you're not changing at all check with your teacher, something's wrong and not like leaps and bounds necessarily. And what I found in my own case of like having engaged with this, it will be almost after the fact, I'll realize, oh, wow, that felt different. Like I won't even know in the moment. And then I'll be like, oh, wow, I was more patient in that moment or I was less critical and the concentric circles. So the people that actually do cause harm and again, don't forget, it's okay to say no and set a boundary for our own protection. We have to, we can't, don't just be stupid and go out there being, I'm compassionate. So I'm going to get in the middle of the, you know, the hustle between the gangs or something like that, like in the middle of the thing, because I'm a compassionate warrior. So this like mentally ill, you know, homeless person with a knife, but I'm the bodhisattva, like, come on you know, be real, be reasonable. And still our heart can have the compassion, even if we realize with our wisdom, we need to refrain from getting in the middle of it, right? So that's my final rant to you all for today. So I want to, I had all of these poems, I was going to read you poems all day, and we got like so into like the discussion, I totally spaced out, but I do have one good one. So just thinking of all of the positive energy. So in Buddhist practice, we try and dedicate all of the positive energy. So dedicating all that we've generated together today, which has just been phenomenal. I mean, thinking of all of the 8 billion people on the planet and how many spent the whole day devoted to cultivating compassion. We could probably count them if we knew. Not many, so amazing. So rejoicing in all of the virtue that we generated today through our practice, through our discussion, through our 
practices that we've done in pairs with each other and really holding the space for this exploration, amazing amount of positive energy. So dedicating that towards our spiritual goals. And then I wanna leave you with this poem by Rosemary Watola Traumer called Sometimes Like Today We Remember. Sometimes like today, we remember that everyone, even the driver in the white Jeep who cut in front of you, yes, even the elegant woman in the dairy aisle, and the man who seems lost on the library steps, and the child sitting alone on the bench, Yes, everyone has a story, fears and hopes, and something to learn, and someone they love, and someone who's hurt them, and someone they long to hold. And though their stories are mostly invisible, they're always more complex than whatever we project, and they're every bit as real as our own. The woman in the dairy aisle smiles at you, and though she's wearing diamonds in her ears, she looks lonely. Or is it you who is lonely? Is it all of us? All of us longing for someone to truly see us. And that driver you're cursing. Don't we all sometimes feel as if we need to move forward any way we can? And that boy on the bench, notice the empty seat beside him. Perhaps you could sit there too in the sun. Who knows what might happen next? So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Ramit and Eleanor for being patient with the hybrid situation. It was so lovely to have you all with us today too in our room from wherever you are. So thank you so much and hope to see you next time in the Zoomiverse. Everybody's waving goodbye. <laughs>